You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to another movie discussion Mm -hmm. here at the Common Descent Podcast, what we are going to now start calling Silver Screen Science. Yes. Another paleontology-adjacent movie has come out recently, you may have heard of, called The Meg, released just this August through Warner Brothers, directed by John Turtletaub. The Meg is a story about a bunch of people exploring the ocean who discover that there's actually a giant prehistoric shark megalodon still out there in the depths and they mess with it and it gets loose and it starts attacking people we're gonna talk as we did in our jurassic park series about the science of the film not just the nitpicky stuff but the broader concepts and where the film fits in what we think is the really fascinating intersection of science and pop culture. Spoiler warnings going up. Indeed. As always, we're going to talk about the whole thing, so there's not many twists and turns in this movie. Yeah, be be prepared. (laughs) (laughs) There's a shark in it. People get eaten by a shark. But in case you care about that kind of stuff, there (laughs) will be spoilers. Also, it's worth pointing out that we are. this recording is a special recording because it is coming to you from Atlanta, mm-hmm. where Will and I are for Dragon Con, making this the first ever Common Descent recording thing, this plus the bonus one that goes along with this, mm-hmm. that is being recorded by Will and me in the same room. Yeah. as but Not over Skype. We're in the same <laughs> state, in the same room, looking at each other. It's pretty cool. It is. So, we're going to talk about the science in the movie, the scientists of the movie, but we will start, as we typically like to do, with the subject that is the reason we are talking about this movie. In this case, the creature, the Meg. Will, what is the Meg? So, the Meg, it's like the Batman. (laughs) Uh, The Meg is referring to Megalodon, as it's popularly called which is referring to a fossil shark, C. megalodon, because it's still debated as to whether it's Cacarius or Cacaricles mm-hmm. megalodon, but C. megalodon. This was a fossil shark that was swimming around the oceans 20 to 2 million years ago, and as far as we found so far was the biggest shark ever. Yes. It's massive estimated 40 to 60 feet long Mm -hmm. in most estimations uh there have been some that pop above that some that stay below that but big teeth the size of your hand mouth wider than most dinner tables are long yes (laughs) like (laughs) big shark has been extremely famous because of the fact that it's big it's it's very much i I mean it's very much how t-rex and triceratops and those other when you're the biggest version of a thing, it's hard for us not to kind of key into that. And Megalodon has been popular more than usual in recent years yeah. because there's been a flurry of pseudoscience going around, mm-hmm. popularized by a couple of Discovery Channel documentaries, which shall remain nameless, <clears throat> that furthered the notion that megalodon is still out there that it's a cryptid that yes it's i was about to say still persists which it doesn't megalodon went extinct around two two and a half million years ago has not been around since the, the- list of why we know that will be discussed when we discuss cryptozoology <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we'll get into this but yes uh, and at first, I was concerned about this movie. I really, I, the reason I went to see this movie, other than the podcast, I was going to see it anyway, because I work in an aquarium, and I was prepared for, I am now going to get questions all about this movie, so I need to go see it so I can reference if they said anything terribly stupid yeah. that's going to le- Honestly, I, I, it, I don't think it... It did not lean on that as much as I thought it was going to. No, it really doesn't. Like, I don't... 
imagine people will come away from this saying, oh, Megalodon's really out there. Yes. The movie is pretty well grounded in the in this being a what if scenario. Yeah, and that it's over the top. It is a r- ridiculous. So that it's yes. At no point does it lead credibility to anything. So yeah, I'm not worried for no reason. I hope. Yeah, it, it the movie establishes this thing is went extinct or so we thought and mm-hmm. it's not out in the oceans somewhere. It's like all over the place there is a very specific yes which we'll talk about in a little bit Mm -hmm. thing the little pocket a lost world kind of scenario so So this movie is an event not a condition yes they make megalodon seem as realistic as king kong yes yeah no that's perfect lost island of diversity that no one's ever heard of that has these crazy creatures in it which is cool. Yeah. Like, yeah, you did not lean into the the, the pseudoscience hype. Like, they didn't have someone nice. at the beginning who was like, I swear it's out there. Yes. Barry took my leg. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess they kind of did. I, they, but not in that way. Not in a historical way. It was it was because of the movie that they, yes. they had a person. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the shark. What, scientifically, how is the shark? It, you actually brought up a, a good one that I wanted to mention just because it was one of those things that lots of things like to do with sharks because it's cool looking and it references a real thing, but it's not how the sharks actually work. Because you mentioned the bite on the pe- plexiglass. Yeah, when we were talking before. Yes, exactly. There's a moment where the shark it, it's a trailer bites, scene. It's in the trailer. It bites the glass on and the side of the habitat. It leaves imprints in the glass of its teeth, and there's multiple rows of teeth there. Mm-hmm. And this is... True, sharks have multiple rows of teeth that they use to replace their old ones as they fall out, and blah, 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 blah. And that the the shark had that correctly. But not all sharks have all their rows exposed at all the time. That is something that we actually talk about at the aquarium regularly. Different sharks arrange their teeth differently depending on what they eat. Mm -hmm. If you are eating fish, you have pointy teeth, and you want as many teeth sticking out of your mouth all at once. So you'll have two or three rows all (laughs) pointing up. It is not like, for them, it's like a fan, like the Chinese fan, you know, silk fans that spread that right, way. Right, right. So your teeth are just all sticking out. The sand tiger shark that you typically find in aquariums though, that are known as ragged tooth sharks because of this, it's just a mouthful of hooks. But if you look at a tiger shark mouth or in great whites, the upper teeth that are serrated like megalodons were for cutting you don't have your saw pointing in all different directions. It makes a <laughs> blade. So there you have one row up. Yes. And they lose a tooth and one tooth comes forward and it is very orderly. It's not a perfect line, but it's orderly. And that's something that happens with sharks a lot is they get they give them those gnarly teeth, very much we talked about with the Indoraptor that bad teeth means menacing. Yep. And sharks have some of those sharks do have those gnarly looking teeth and it makes people say like that's it's scary looking because of that but those are the least harmless teeth for you (laughs) it's the blade that's what removes the stuff and overall the teeth and the general body shape it they base their megalodon on a great white it's a big great white and thus it was a fairly realistic looking shark yep uh i noticed they up the size yes they did they called it in the in the movie 20 to 25 meters Although I don't know, and that that's like sixty to eighty feet. Yes, which is I I think an older estimate. Yes. So I mean, they may have been pulling from that, or they may have said, "Bring me all the estimates and pick the biggest one." Yeah. So, eh. Now I don't remember if they had said that because there was early in the movie they discover where the shark lives. Mm-hmm. The shark escapes. Mm-hmm. They have an encounter with the shark. They kill the shark. Spoilers, remember? I told uh, you. Yep, yep. And then the bigger one shows up. Yes. And I don't remember if the 20, 25 meter estimate was for the first one. Or just in general. Because they had only ever seen mm-hmm. the one. So I don't I don't know how big the biggest of the sharks is supposed to be. But regardless, they've oversized it, yeah. as movies are fond of doing. There was a, a, a kind of neat moment where they kill the smaller one and Statham notices the mouth and references the bite on the plexiglass yeah 
does that look like that matches? And then that's when it is revealed there's a bigger one. Yes. That was, that was kind of neat. I mean, you can measure, get a rough estimate for shark size based on mouth gape. And so, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah. They also had it do the classic fin above the water thing. Mm -hmm. well, it, how else will your fin get a tan? Yes, exactly. <laughs> What was most interesting to me about the way the shark is portrayed is the way it was portrayed hunting. Yeah. Because very early on, when they discover it in its habitat, they make the point that it is drawn to light. Yes. That if the lights are on in your little vessel, your, your submersible, it will come for you. Yeah. And that is a repeated theme of this shark being a visual hunter. Yeah. Which was interesting to me they also they have it hunt in three ways throughout the show mm -hmm. they talk about it hunting by like blood they draw Scent. it in with blood which is a classic shark thing yes like yes it will be attracted to blood that makes sense they have it hunt visually and i don't know i you would know better than i would whether or not that's realistic for most sharks they have decent vision it is not super detailed vision and it is not color vision Mm -hmm. So they use vision for the final strike. Sharks use that to zero in on what they're going to bite. But they, it's not usually long distance. Like our sharks bump into stuff all the time. Yes. Because uh, <laughs> if they're not paying attention or they're half sleeping, you know, that, yeah. So like, I mean, as far as I know, most sharks. Now, also, I think great whites do have better vision they're also they're one of the few sharks known to do the spy hopping where they actually stick their head above water yeah yeah to check on prey on the shore because they're waiting for seals and sea lions to come out so they might i haven't actually looked into that to see if great whites have noticeably better vision or if we know yeah yeah but i think of sharks as hunting by smell by electro reception which movies do not take advantage yeah. of by lateral line mm -hmm. just sensing movement in the water kind of thing the other one that was really weird is two times at least, and one time very noticeably, Yes, they have it hunt by hearing. Yeah. At the end of the movie, there's a part where they have to, they want to draw it in, and they play a whale song. Yep. Because they know it eats whales. We saw it eat some whales early yep. on. And they play a whale song, and that's so, that's very strange to me. That's, it's, because they, because they use vibrations a couple times. Mm-hmm. People and, splashing in the water. Yeah. So that's going to attract it. And technically sound is vibration. So like it could feel that. But fish don't actually have ears. So the fact that they focus so hard on it being sound. You know, we're going to yes. use underwater speakers. We're going to. Yeah. That was. that. Yeah. That was kind of odd. And there's a moment at the end where the little girl and DJ, I think was his name, mm -hmm. are in the water and he's screaming. And yes. she says. Stop screaming, you're going to draw it in. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's noise. That's a yeah. weird... And that's noise above the water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they, they had it... They, the movie couldn't quite decide how they wanted it to hunt. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it had a lot of those things where they, they kept making up a new rule for the thing that was going to attract it or something. And yes. what they had to avoid or something like that. It also hunted, oh, the thing that really, this was probably the thing that irked me the most about its hunting style, mm -hmm. is the big scene yes. in the movie is yes. when it goes to the beach. Mm -hmm. There's the Sanya Beach in China, and there's a kajillion people there, and the shark is drawn there because of all the people and such, and it's hunting them at the beach, and there's at least one overhead shot of it swimming around just under the water. Yep. This you said this was an eighty foot shark. Yes, it's not swimming at the beach. It's it's and when it, it's also that thing of like, are these people swimming out and to just, just just swimming out into the ocean? It's just, just gonna go a mile just away keep from going. shore. Just keep like, going. <laughs> this is this shark is swimming in the area where you can still practically touch the bottom. Yeah, or at least swim down and reach it very easily. This yes. should not. This this shark should be crawling. <laughs> this is an open water animal because it can't fit anywhere else. Well, it's the same thing, and this this came out before we were doing any of this stuff, so we may have we may retroactively go back to these kind of things someday. Even if it's not paleo, but the shallows mm -hmm. had a scene like that where so the shallows movie came out. I don't remember when. Great white terrorizing woman who's stuck on a little outcropping of rock 
and buoy and she basically she's stuck within spinning distance of the beach but can't get to it because she's in the quote-unquote territory of a rogue shark both things that aren't true but there's a scene and i only know it from the trailer because i didn't go see this because why would i <laughs> there's a scene where one of the people this woman was with or near is like sees what's happening and turns around and starts swimming toward the beach like crazy and then the great white attacks this person in breaches but they're like 30 40 50 feet from the beach somewhere in, in it yeah where'd you get that momentum where'd from? you yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's i did a long jump from a standing position it is what basically happened there and it's the same concept here of like you know, just because you can't see the bottom doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> yes. And that gets a little bit into this subject that I assume will come up every time we do this, these movie discussions. Absolutely. Of monsterification. And the reason it's important that we bring this up, I, like, we are not just trying to say it is a mistake movies are making every time. Because it is done purposefully. It yes. is done on pur This is not an oh, accident yeah. that Absolutely. they... Absolutely. They did this on purpose to make the monster, the creature, a character that has nefarious characteristics. Otherwise, we would not root for it to die. Yes. No one would have been happy if the T-Rex died at the end of Jurassic Park because it was not monstrified. And at no point did it have ill intent. The reason we bring this up is because it is too easy to then translate these things to the real thing. Yep. And it feeds on misconceptions about how animals work. Absolutely. And, and it feeds, it, it encourages misconceptions. Yes. It is It is saying not only are we going to bank off of your misconception, we're going to encourage you to keep thinking so. Yes. Because then you'll come see Meg too. And you get these features that don't really make sense for an animal, but make lots of sense for a movie monster. In this film, you know, it's got that hypersensitivity to, I'll hear you, I'll smell you, I, I'll, I, yeah, I'm, I'll see I, you. I'm on the prowl for you. Like, yes. You, if you breathe wrong, I Yeah, you look it. in my direction. The biggest one, I think, in this, and it's the same thing they do, this is very, very common, that notion of, because it's got super strength. Oh, yeah. Like we've discussed before, because it's biting metal submersibles and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's also really big. And yeah. sharks have big bite force. Hey, yeah, I, sure. there's, there is active debate on how strong things like Megalodon and even the modern Great White actually are because you can't tell a shark to bite down as hard as it can. Yes. So we use computer models. <laughs> the computer models are surprisingly high. So maybe they're not or maybe they are. So it's maybe it could, but yeah. But what it definitely does is it focuses way too much on people. Yes. There's a point in the movie where one of the characters says it should be safe to swim yes. after the shark because why would it care about you? You're super tiny. Yep. And then the shark spends the rest of the movie chasing after individual people. And like changing direction to focus on a person who is yes. now splashing louder a person who is a tiny fraction of their size yes and it's that very monstrous why would you go after a tiny person why is that food appealing to you this when... is an animal that is probably dozens of tons yes <laughs> of weight that we know just ate three whales yes <laughs> <laughs> like you your human is 150 pounds that's not this is not a filter feeder that's once again that's like me beating up david to get to a chicken nugget like i i'm going yeah. to get that that's it's the same reason that the, the fight in king kong with all the t-rex makes no sense is why is this large predator going out of its way and putting itself in harm's way at time to get to a useless morsel and it's and you could make arguments that i'm sure well, maybe it's starving maybe it's you know it's death, you know, some, and yes, you could, but they don't. And that's not the point. The point <laughs> is it has to be scary. Yes. It has to come after people, which I think works against it. I think the shark is too big to be scary in that way. Well, I find it silly. It is watching it eat people is as scary as watching us eat popcorn. Yes. Like, I'll, you know, watch me eat a, a, a unslaughtered pig without utensils. That's horrifying. <laughs> yes. Watching me eat cut up ham is not horrifying because once I put it in my mouth, it's gone. This shark swallows people. It's not, it shouldn't be biting them. So the shark is an embellishment on the fossil 
It's a weird shark. It's a bit monstery. So it's got a few of those those traits. It also is referred to as a living fossil. Yep. Which twitching. Yep. Uh, not a thing. Don't don't stop it. It's we'll a bad term. Argue about that at some point. <laughs> So clearly the movie revolves around the Megalodon in this case, but there's other science in this movie. There there are other aspects of science beyond just the shark. And since what we're interested in here, of course, is how the movie treats science, let's talk about some of the other science in the movie. Particularly, I think the most interesting thing is where and how they find the shark. Yeah, the the locale that they're doing research in is a very interesting one. So the, the whole premise in this one is that the a the lead scientist of this movie has a hypothesis that I don't remember for sure, but I'm sure they called theory in the movie, <laughs> has a hypothesis that you know, many of the trenches, like the Mariana Trench that we have measured down to a certain depth, are actually deeper than that because that the bottom of the trench is actually a layer of cold, dense, liquid you know, within the water layer that has sunk below it. I think he said hydrogen sulfide yeah. gas. Yeah, there you go. I, I couldn't remember what he they had called it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's this layer. So it's a false bottom, yes. effectively. And sonar bounces off of it as if it's a floor. So we have marked, all right, Mariana Trench is blank right. deep. And he's saying it actually is slightly deeper based on his studies. And so they're sending a vessel down to go in there and they find a hydrothermal vent realm at the bottom of the trench deeper than we ever thought so deeper than anyone's ever been yes hidden by this layer of sea fog which is an interesting concept i like it well it's very it's very much it's very much a classic of this kind of movie it's the yes. lost world it's the the plateau that where time stood still. It's the savage land, tropical paradise under Antarctica. Absolutely. It you found a a warm water region in the depths of the ocean where prehistoric things are still around that have been capped off. For, yes, that have trapped down there for times long forgot. And that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. That's they kind of went. I've never heard of a movie doing the lost world concept. In the ocean. Yeah. That's actually pretty cool. Absolutely. Uh, and it's ridiculous. Uh, scientifically, it's ridiculous. Oh, no. it's It makes no sense. Why would heat and cold... Like, that's my big thing is... All right, there's a cold layer. Cool. Like, we see stuff like that in the ocean where it's... There is a lagoon of extra briny water mm -hmm. that is so salt-rich. It is denser than the rest of the ocean around it. And it yes. is a lagoon in the ocean. Yep. That you could dip your finger into and splash if you... But if it's a cold layer within a hot layer underneath it, well, heat transfers. So... Yeah. <laughs> Although I will say, I this is the first time I remember hearing the word thermocline yes, yes. used in a movie. That's... And props to you guys. That good term. Yeah. Thermocline. That... Thermocline refers to a difference in temperature as you go up or down. Yeah. Uh, either elevation underwater, it could also refer to above the water, I yeah. believe. But yeah, good term. Mm -hmm. People around the world might know the word thermocline now. That's pretty cool. That was, and uh, also to the to the movies, not benefit but defense. This is what it was in the book. Uh, this is true. This is all based on a. This novel. is specifically what blocked the megalodon, the megalodons, yes. all those megs, megs off from the rest of the ocean was a extreme thermocline and I, the idea i guess is that they need warm water yes to survive and now they're trapped down there because if they go up it's the super cold water mm -hmm. you'd have to go all the way up to the surface to get to and they can't breach that barrier right and they presumably they've been trapped down there since the water's chilled during the ice age which doesn't make a whole ton of sense yeah it's it, you know, once again, the, the system, same way you can't have a tropical environment under an Arctic one. Yes. That's not how temperature works. <laughs> if, if you put a hot pot pie in the freezer, it freezes. Yes. Does the, pre the crust does not protect it. <laughs> it doesn't create a thermocline. It doesn't create a hydrogen sulfide barrier. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not how it works. But the, the ecosystem it shows down there is an interesting one. It is. Is I was thinking about that. 
that it's high, it's got the hydrogen sulfide the hydrothermal vents yeah which was a nice touch i don't know how deep hydrothermal vents go i actually no i don't know i don't know if there's any particular reason why you couldn't get them in a trench not that i know of the fish in the trench all looked unusually normal I, that was actually something that i both appreciated and then in hindsight and in, in hindsight regretted about the movie is that they say this environment has probably been untouched for you know thousands if not millions of years i can't remember how they phrased it but yeah. they they say that this has been capped off and it's in it's suggested that this is a lost world scenario when a fossil shark shows up aka megalodon but they never show anything else no to indicate that on their on the cool side all the stuff they show are real deep sea creatures were they when they were going through i was like oh there's a chimera oh that's a wolf eel oh that's a two like they were actually using real stuff down there i one of the things that i actually came out of there thinking was you showed what i thought what i what appeared to be coral down there i i'd have to we they also did the thing where they that they love to do in deep ocean stuff and cave stuff where they want to put blue lights everywhere because it makes it prettier (laughs) and okay but they had coral, and I came. I was talking with Sean and Brian of the A Touch of Grey podcast, our friends Sean and Brian, indeed, about this. And I was like, "Yeah, the coral. I saw the coral, and that was." I was like, "I coral in a trench." Mm-hmm. But Sean corrected me and pointed out that there are actually deep sea corals. There are indeed. They're non photosynthetic, but there are deep sea corals. They're so basically that... communal anemones that just eat. Yeah. So. I actually, I think the exploration of the trench was my favorite part of the movie. I'd agree. Because all the people are like, this is going to be super cool. Mm -hmm. We're going to find new species. Like, it was a fun, exciting little moment that is then punctuated both figuratively and literally Mm. by (laughs) the giant shark that shows up. Yeah. So it's, they got some cool concepts down there. The, The main thing that is misleading about it is they go through the layer and it's it's immediately like they've entered an aquarium where there's just life everywhere. Yeah. Which it's like a reef. Yes, it's like a reef. And truthfully, around hydrothermal vents, life is very dense. Yes. Like it is literally crawling across every surface on those vents. But it is not typical for there to be a huge expansive range of vents. Because that's just not how geothermal activity typically functions. Ge- hydrothermal vents are also temporary. They die eventually yep. whenever the gas that's feeding them gets cut off by an earthquake or a volcano that draws the pressure away. Who knows what it could be? So they are usually temporary. So it's the bottom of the ocean is a desert. Yeah. Except for these oases of weirdly high nutrition. So they took a real life ecosystem in the ocean tweaked it a little bit to make it look cool plopped it at the bottom of this fictional trench scenario and added a fossil shark to it basically which is it's you've built on real stuff yeah and it's well it's kind of like you know you know take you know taking fantasy creatures and making semi realistic things based off of the real animals this one I felt was just odd because Megalodon is literally the only old thing down there. Yes. Like, yes, chimeras are also old, but they're also still around. Yeah, they're not. It wasn't a lost world in the sense of time stood still. It's yes. a lost world like this one particular shark is still here. Yeah, th- this is where Megalodons didn't get the memo. Yes. Not anyone else. A couple other interesting things that came to mind in terms of sciencey stuff the two vessels that they use to explore the bottom of the trench were called origin and evolution Mm -hmm. which i very much appreciated yeah that was kind of neat and and i was wondering if you had a perspective on this there is a very brief moment where the movie takes a step off to the side to talk about shark finning yeah like they come upon, I guess it's a fishing vessel, yeah, or yeah. the remains of a fishing vessel. Having been sunk by the escaped Megalodon. Yep. That it's a bunch of sharks with their fins cut off. Yep. And the, the movie kind of takes a pause so one of the characters can go, 
if essentially say shark finning how terrible yeah it's it's they they say something about how terrible it is and then that the megalodon has even the score <laughs> yep that they it, it got revenge intentionally or not on people for unsustainable and cruel practices in shark fishing which was probably my favorite part of the movie because in my mind that's the first time i've ever seen shark finning mentioned in a in a blockbuster in a theater released movie yeah i don't think i've ever seen it ever come up so for people who don't know shark finning is the practice of catching a shark cutting off the fins which are valuable for for certain foods and such and then throwing the rest of the shark back where it is doomed to die due to drowning usually yeah and it's just an enormous waste of life and and it's it's a a generally frowned upon practice and the reason it's so devastating because there's nothing wrong with eating sharks shark meat can be bought in many a grocery store Mm -hmm. the issue with shark finning is that the shark fins sell more for more than the meat does because of meaningless delicacies you know fun fact shark fin soup does not have flavor in and of itself it must be seasoned (laughs) but it is the novelty and reputation of shark fin soup that makes it worth a lot so you can sell the fins for more than the meat so to make your ultimate profit you should only get fins but the cargo hold of your ship is the same size so you must kill four times as many sharks to fill it yeah to get enough fins to fill it so it's just one of those where you end up killing so many more sharks than you would have if you just also took the meat and it's just generally you're mutilating them. Oh, it's it's yeah, and horrific, it's just a distasteful thing. Practice, to, yeah. So it was interesting that the movie took a moment. the The movie really does come down on the side of nature. Yes, they in make many a number ways, of comments, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So there's some science mm-hmm. uh, to be discussed. Actually, a really interesting movie scientifically. And then, also unusual in movies like this, the cast is full of scientists. Yeah, it's you're on a research station with multiple specialists, multiple scientists. Yeah. Now, to be fair, most of them don't get to do much that is science-y. Mm-mm. And it's one of those where it has the typical issue of very vague reasons behind the science. Yes. It's, it's what was the goal here to make a movie? Yeah, well, there's a point where they say that, like, the entire purpose here was to di- prove or disprove this hypothesis. And, and, and they, the guy who's, because one of the main characters is the guy who funds the, the research expedition station and he and, comes yeah. to visit it. And they're like, now we're going to see after all our work. And he says, and what if you're wrong? And the answer that the head scientist gives is, <sighs> then you will have wasted Eight some, billion dollars yeah some or obscene no, the uh, amount of money it's like that's not really how research works no <laughs> and and they reveal that the goal was basically for this millionaire this bajillionaire that they would find that there was a false bottom and there would be stuff below it and then he could they never make it clear if he's wanting to profit off the stuff directly that they find like harvest it for things or if yeah. he's somehow going to profit off the discovery or the research. I think a lot of people who make movies have a mind that those who make cool publications are now rich. Yeah. I think a lot of people who make movies have the idea that if you did the cool, the better science, ah, now you're going to be rolling yeah, you in get it. more money. No. No, not how it <laughs> works. He, or that if you get all the grants. Yes. Like you, you get grants, and thus you have more money. It's like, well, yes, but all of that money needs to be allocated. You know, there's a contract when you sign a grant. <laughs> yeah, to that doesn't go in your pocket. Like that goes to your students that you're paying to work, and it's at their salary, mm-hmm. and it goes to your equipment, and it goes to your trip to go do your research project across the world. Like all of that needs to be allocated places. And so that this one. It's cool that we have scientists and that we have research and we are introduced to here is what my hypothesis has been. And yeah. we are now going to confirm or deny this hypothesis. But it also has the issue that a lot of movies have where it is our experiment has failed. Therefore, it has all been meaningless up till this point. 
Yes. And that there is vague benefits to the science that is never explained capitalism wise. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, but naming a new species doesn't pay. No. In fact, it <laughs> often costs you money yes, to does. get it published. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing that was interesting here is that the head scientist, whose name I don't remember, Mm -hmm. uh, what's her name's dad? Yes. He definitely came off as very nature for the sake of nature. Yeah. Because when they go down to the bottom of the trench, he says, we're going to discover species no one's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. That's a cool, that's what a scientist would say in that scenario. We're going to see stuff no one's ever seen. How cool is that? Mm Mm-hmm. When they're talking about how to deal with Megalodon, they want to kill it. Mm-hmm. And he makes a comment where he's like, we we do that. We discover and we destroy. Yeah. You know, this is this is what we do every time. Yes. And he very much is on the side. He's that, our he's our Malcolm our Ian Malcolm. Yes, of The movie. He speaks for the the animals. He, he's, <laughs> he's the the Lorax. Yes, you know? Exactly. The research, the guy in charge, like the the guy who who's funding it, mm-hmm. he seems to be the one that has no idea what's going on. As exemplified, and this this is the thing that bothered me the most about it is that he comes in and he's like, "I've been funding your project for a billion, a billion dollars. So what are you doing? Yeah, what have you been? Like, what have you been that, up to? That is not how it works. You do no. not you do not give a research vessel." a couple billion dollars and then check in on them three years later to see what their plan was. Well, it's, it's, I saw a video that made the same point when it came to like deep blue sea, where it's the same concept of I'm here to fund. Whoa. What are you doing to those shark brains? Yep. Do you just write checks and then put them in mailboxes? Yeah. Like <laughs> I'm going to follow this paper trail. Oh, I ended up at a research station. Neat. All right. It's, he is shockingly uninformed of what he's paying for. And then immediately furious when it doesn't yield yes, what he thought was going to be profit, even though he didn't know what the, it's. It's just, yeah, it has those things of like, that's not how scientific funding works. That's not how science works. That's not how you benefit from like discovering new species does not make marketable goods. Yes. <laughs> and he's he kind of does the greedy Mm-hmm. thing but at the same time he, it seems like he's just not very good at it yep the scientists in this there's a lot of scientists none of them are particularly well developed but that's not scientist specific in this movie yeah no one's particularly well developed in this movie it's and, not a very well developed movie and they they all have that thing of each one is for an entire research station the scientist of this thing at the station you know yeah. and a lot of them i don't know what they did no like no. There was the the lady who I guess was a computery person. She she was the she was the tech person. She the, was yeah the tech person. She she made the shark cage. She made the subs. Yeah. She made the computer things. She and then, made and then all that stuff goes down. But she remains in the movie. Yep. And she doesn't have anything to do. Yep. We had one guy who was the rover driver. Yeah. And that was it. That was his job. He drove the rover. And it's one of those where it's like, that. why is the sub dropping off a rover and then transferring the remote controls miles back to the... Well, okay. Especially since you had three people on the sub. Yes. It's, there's a whole lot of cast yeah. in this movie. Yes. So we, have, we do have scientists, and they make some cool scientific comments. Like, they have moments where they will say things that are actually, you know, like his comments on the conservation side and the discovery side of science. But... I I know they say what they do, but we don't actually lean on that description very heavily, you know. Yeah. Like we when we discuss Jurassic Park, you know, Ian never discusses dinosaurs, Grant never discusses chaos theory. These are I build stuff. It's they're the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I do machines. I know shark anatomy. Yep. I I know trenches. But all they, right. And they also do the thing uh, and we talked about this in the the la- earlier series that the uber scientists, the person that I am the smart person. Yes. A little bit in this one where they have like the person who is apparently the shark biologist also knows how to pilot the sub by herself. Also. And they also they they immediately know how to poison it. They immediately know where she like she says, I know where to put this. 
Yes. Okay. To, to kill this shark. On this shark you've never seen. Yep. And then Jason Statham's character, who's not a scientist in the movie, he's mm-hmm. a, he's a, a deep sea rescuer, but he has the thing where there's a point early on where he's like, it's going to be attracted to the light and it's going to hunt like this. And it, the, you, it would be an overstatement to say you saw this shark once. Yes. You didn't see this shark once. Yes. You saw the bite marks from this shark once. Why are why do you know all this? How are you explaining he's he's all that, the details of it? The most anatomy? insightful person yes. in the world. All every insight he ever has is correct. Yep. And it's they have a lot of that where it's you you all are just making statements and treating it like it's because you're an expert, but that's not how those things work. So the Meg is a movie with a lot of science to talk about, actually. And you could get into nitty gritties of like what stuff at the bottom yes. trench is actually like and but for the most part we like to keep the the discussions in this series broader topics yeah the science the creatures the we're, scientists we're not going into how subs work and yes the mechanics of those things but we do like our little tradition here of giving ourselves an opportunity to get super nitpicky mm-hmm. before we wrap up the episode in a segment that we like to call our mini rants Will, do you have a mini rant about the Meg? Of course I do. Mine actually calls back to something we mentioned earlier in the hunting behavior of the shark, that it it, it seems to be searching for any sign of life, uh, which already goes that monstrification thing of why is it constantly hungry? But it goes to another thing that we don't just tend to do with mon- monster movies, creature feature things. We tend to do this with all animals in all movies. And it's a it's a video game mentality. I hate the premise and concept that animals react to all stimuli. Mm -hmm. Every noise is going to attract. If you snap a twig in the woods, the bear's going to come. Yes. (laughs) If if you splash in the water, the shark's going to come. If a drop of water enters the water, the sharks are going to be there in droves. Mm-hmm. That's not how it works. Things happen when you're not there. <laughs> all right? Your actions yes. are not all fascinating to animals. If if a, if a drop of blood falls in the water and there are no sharks around to smell it, does it make a smell? Does it matter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing is I get asked that all the time of like, well, yeah, but can't they smell blood? It's like, well, yes, but you can smell dog food, can't you? Yes. <laughs> does it excite you? No, because it doesn't matter to you. I'm sure they can smell it, and they might make them curious, but it also doesn't smell like their food. Animals are discerning. There's a reason your dog, or many dogs, and your cats don't eat each other's food. (laughs) There's a reason that squirrels aren't attacking birds and devouring them, because they know it's not their food. And every, you know, it's the, it's this mentality is what causes people to splash water at the touch pools to try to get the animals to come over and to go to parks and Uh go... Or when they go to the zoo and tap on the glass. Yes. Tap, tap. Do something interesting it's obvi- and stimulating. Obviously, and- this is the most interesting thing that could be. And it's based off this thing that animals are mechanical in that if you if you provide a correct input, they will react in a specific way, mm-hmm. which is how they work in video games. Throw the distraction thing over there and the AIs will go there so that you can sneak over because that's the mechanics. But anyone who's tried to, like, work with an animal, does your dog always drop the tennis ball? No, because it can make choices. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just that mentality. I hate that mentality that it's, I mean, Stranger Things, anyone who ever bleeds in the main cast, the Demogorgon shows up. <laughs> no one yeah. else in town cut their hand while cooking? No one else. But it smells your blood everywhere you go. And will jump dimensions to get... That's just... That's not how animals work. They don't yeah. care about you. <laughs> and it's just... It gets annoying because it makes them seem stupid. And it always is used against them in the movies. My mini rant for this one isn't something specific to this movie either. Uh, they make an offhanded comment. It's it's a three-word comment <laughs> that got... And I just... <laughs> ah, you used that. It would have been Living Fossils. Yes, that would have been my mini rant if they hadn't, because they say it's a living fossil, but then they follow it up immediately with the the words, "It has no natural predators." <laughs> I hate that because I'll see people do this. I'll be like, "Well, how do you what what do you do against an animal with no natural predators?" So mm-hmm. they'll ask, "Did T Rex what were, could it have possibly had any natural yeah. predators?" 
dear world, there is no such thing as an animal with no natural predators. Yes. For two reasons. Number one, all, no matter how big the species is, it lives with other members of its own species. Yep. And number two, no matter how big the species is, it doesn't start that way. Yes. All animals have natural predators because all animals start out tiny. You say, well, cr- an, a, the uh, alligator, the American alligator is the largest creature in its habitat, and it's the top predator. What could possibly threaten it? What could threaten it? Everything. Fish and birds and other alligators, because they start off tiny. Yeah. And that's where most of your hunting takes place, is going after other things. Like, going after so infants. What are, what are the natural predators of Megalodon? Well, assuming that Megalodon were born roughly the size of a full-grown human, Mm-hmm. Which is probably reasonable. That, great great whites are born at like four feet long yeah, or something. Yeah, that, that sounds very reasonable. Then their natural predators are all of the sharks. <laughs> like, yeah. that's the natural predator of Megalodon. All the other sharks and possibly dolphins. Oh, yeah. And certainly orcas. Oh, yeah. Like, just because your adult size is big, most of you don't make it to adult size. <laughs> and a lot of the reasons that you don't make it to adult size are other predators. That catch you before you get up there. Yeah. So please don't, please stop referring to, if, if dear listeners, please evict this phrase from your vocabulary. Yeah. No natural predators. It's one of those things, a full grown blue whale is not being hunted. Yes. But it has reached that size. Yes. Through. It is, it is one of very few. Exactly. And so it, it, yeah, it's, it's 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 saying like this person has no natural bullies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're the biggest person now, then yeah, probably not. Yeah. I it, don't have any natural were, bullies because I'm seven almost once. thirty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I don't get bullied anymore. But alas, that's enough about this stupid movie. <laughs> If you are a patron, we will put up an episode, a special bonus episode on Patreon, where we will discuss our personal thoughts on the movie itself, not just not the science. So it's, we've discussed that here, but just what we thought of the movie as our a movie. Our experience watching it. Yes. Other than that, we hope you enjoyed. This is the, the response to the Jurassic Park discussions was so positive. Yeah. That, and then this came out. We're like, let's do this. If people continue to enjoy this silver screen science series type discussions, let us know and we will happily do more of these because these are a lot of fun. It's one of our favorites. But it is late here in this room where we are sitting across from each other recording into the same (laughs) microphone. So we're going to wrap this episode up so that we may go back to enjoying Dragon Con tomorrow and join us in the future for more discussions and until then sign off phrase bye see you guys thanks for listening to the common descent podcast you can follow us on facebook twitter youtube and check our wordpress blog for pictures and links after each episode Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.